Hi, this is a revision or a conversation, or it should be a conversation, um, but it's not in person. I'm not there in person today. But this is a revision on the book of um, Farish Mustafi, um, one of her books, um, The Function of Ornament. And she has got uh, another two books, or even, even more books, but uh, there's the rather two interesting books that work together with. Um, the function of ornament is the function of form and also the function of style. And she, interestingly enough, in many of her uh, talks and um, seminars that she gives, uh, that's also mentioned in the book, um, uh, these three uh, aspects are three different topics. Uh, they are interlinked uh, with each other when architecture comes to, to the table. So, and she talks about the ornaments, that uh, Kenyan ornaments must not take into consideration the, its purpose as a representation of a region, a history, or a person which has, which has this, which is much rooted in the past, uh, where Tu is talking about uh, Sullivan, Louis Sullivan. Uh, it's today's, which Sullivan is coming from the 20th century, uh, part of the history and uh, we are in the 21st century. So this is a further development of Sullivan's ideas and architecture. So, so our ornaments must not be, must not take a representation of a recent history or a person, but as an innovation. Innovation as a function that is to do with anything that matters, that is represented by technology, and fourth, with embrace of cultural designs and fantasy, and ornament, which also represent, represents cultural designs and fantasy. Um, Rain Kuhas says that we have come into the 21st century with the idea of forms, form and function, which is defined by idealism, senselessness and simple repetition, where, where all this architecture has been trapped in the ideal and definition of function, and therefore function has been having a singular direction with no, tri uh, with no creativity. Function um, uh, with this idea from the Sullivan era, let's say, has become isomorphic. Whereas at the same time during this period, uh, there's been some uh, avant-garde architecture with the been bringing in his works political approaches to design and responses to grief, getting distance away from the ordinary architecture. It can be arguably said that um, this type of architecture, the avant-garde architecture, uh, is closer to art. At the same time, a range of exciting architecture that expresses have been expressing unity and uniqueness. Uniqueness, I mean. So all those new architecture come from the public sector, private clients. Some are museums, some are shopping malls, office, private houses, public spaces, which you get, you can see on the first uh, on the first picture. So there is um, a single response. Uh, where each element of design, and ornament, and form, and structure, and style has got a function, and they are unique. So, and today these practices don't work alone. They work in partnership in collaboration with other industries such as engineering, acoustic, structural, uh, environmental strategy, and whatever industry is necessary to deliver quality and contemporary architecture, where the architect Nowadays, he acts as the main uh, manager, let's say. The manager organizes the teams of these different industries to get the best service and the best ideas that they have in their mind properly out, out of the paper. So all these aspects of breakthrough architecture raise the question of where does all these designs and architecture come from? Do these design and architecture come from a common ground where all new architecture uh, immerse from the same source, or uh, is there any political implication to these designs? Are the 
they switch to the actual markets. Um, so it can go further, can reach questions like, can a city be considered uh, as a quality, having a quality design where every building is different from two other? So what, what's going to be the result? Is this new, exciting, new architecture, experimentation or architecture that goes forth onto every, every, every building in a city, for instance? So in parallel, in parallel to what has been happening in the last 10, 15 years in architecture with this amazing process and experimentation, if you compare with the older architecture of the past, there's also been recession, which brought some excitement amongst some architect architects, where they saw a path back to the past, which is less risky and within, within a security zone. So we, we, we find uh, uh, two, uh, let's say, groups of people working with the uh, avant-garde, exciting, experiment, experimental architecture, uh, and at the same time, there is people who we don't we don't want to go there. We don't want to touch the language and experimentation risks in this. We want to to stay looking to the past and just create the same, if we can say. So this experiment had only been possible through the application of new technology, technology that allows new ideas to put into practice. Even new techniques, materials, and systems that were never explored before are now being satirically made as a new technology put to test all necessary aspects in relation to health and safety and security, strength of materials, different in different conditions, heating, ventilation performance, lighting performance, so on and so forth. And if you take a closer look at this new architecture, you will really see the form and function is not as a usual format. So the, the experimentational architecture has created is working with two um, tools, if you may, if we may say that it's not uh, the same tools that you they will use in Sullivan's time. Um, talk, as I talked about the market previously, it's important to say that uh, the ever volatile short changes of the market forces architecture innovations to find its own speed. Uh, the market is changed daily, weekly, monthly. The economic market I'm talking about, which also drives architecture, design, etc. Um, but architecture cannot change that fast. It just it is just impossible. Because of that innovation, architecture responds in a repetition way. Having said that, against the cycle of the market, the fundamental condition of architecture is repetition, within which there is innovation and experimentation as a response in history where architecture evolves within a pathway, if we can say that, okay? And to evolve people as part of this equation, architecture has to create forms and ornaments of dialogue to start conversation, a relationship between building and people. It seems that intensity of form and ornament provokes a reaction on people, and this reaction creates an affection between the two parts. Uh, I could say one part, which is the human part. Uh, and this affection is delivered by pattern that can be, can be generated by both form and, er and ornament. And this pattern, a repetition of lines with different qualities, but that can be stretched further, so this passage would have an affection on people and people's emotions, either, either or both directly or indirectly. Directly where the quality of life in the passage brings comfort, warm, security, direction, and also indirectly where it can bring, uh, bring in past experiences to the actual moment. So going back to the equation where people come in, the new experiences, experimental architecture plays an effect instead of meaning. It is not important anymore to the building to be an up building to be meaningful, but it, it is it must be affected. The building must be affected in a way that brings emotions out of its users. Ornament occupies the roles of a symbolic meaning that finds their own way to articulate patterns of language to connect people with the building and with society and with themselves. 
that style of book back and forth. So I brought this example, uh, the Robert Bond College in London, uh, in Greenwich, designed by a um, foreign uh, office architecture. So it's a, it's a very uh, simple, well, not simple, but um, they because it is close, uh, it's a building close to O2 Arena, which is a lot of people members there. They try to work out the facade of this building and bring the building in a scaleless um, dimension because of the massive scale of its neighbor. So they work with the pattern, they work with the ornaments of, of the scheme of the building where they could uh, uh, work with an infinite pattern where there is no bounds, there is no beginning, middle and end. And within that they could they could also uh, integrate different sizes of windows where it would uh, reflect, not reflect, it would, it would uh, functional for uh, uh, different uses within the building. So, and the patterns also kind of as hard those those windows because of of the design of the infinite aspect in the design of the pattern, and that can be seen from the, also from the from the inside where you see the difference of sizes of windows and the platforms that that will work with uh, split um, split floor to build communication uh, and open the space in uh, you know for a specific function within the building. Uh, so you can see some parts of the building that use uniform windows, some parts of the building that is non uniform windows. So it's uh, it's the pattern, the scheme, the outside scheme allows the interior to be further developed in a more ordinary way. So it's the ornament here um, define, let's say, define form, and which has been further in and then defining uh, experiences, uh, which deliver different experience from the people who are using the, uh, uh, the building from, from the inside, and from the people who are uh, just looking at the building from the outside. So it is very important to understand the purpose, the, uh, let's say, contemporary purpose of ornaments. So where um, experimental architecture can be further developed in a proper way, in a unique way, and, uh, and that can be timeless to its users and to the context where it cites. Thank you very much.